In chapter six, we introduce the molecule DNA, which is the coding molecule that provides the instructions for how a cell um, grows, develops, um, and functions throughout its life. We'll also talk about gene expression, which is the process of taking information from the DNA and turning it into something functional in the organism. So I'm sure everyone is familiar with DNA. You've heard of all kinds of buzzwords about DNA, um, de sequencing DNA, forensic science and DNA evidence, all kinds of things um, go back to this mysterious molecule called DNA. <clears throat> DNA is the fundamental molecule that codes for all of the information that allows for an organism to live, to function, and to grow. It encodes um, small molecules called proteins, which are essentially the workers in the cell. These proteins um, do all of the work to give a cell and therefore an organism um, its physical characteristics, its metabolic activities, um, its ability to grow and to develop. So we're going to start out by asking, what is DNA and what does DNA do? So I've already sort of talked about what it does. Um, DNA is a molecule uh, that living organisms have um, essentially in every cell in their body. There are a few um, weird ones uh, that don't actually contain DNA, but we're just sort of going to talk about DNA as being present uh, pretty much everywhere. And it contains instructions for the functions in the cell. Um, each individual's DNA is unique to them. Um, and uh, that information that all of your cells carry is sort of a combination of both of your parents' DNA that has been passed down to you. Um, we leave DNA all over the place, um, intention unintentionally mostly. Um, when you slough off skin cells or a piece of hair falls out, um, uh, when you uh, bleed on something, all of these things leave traces of DNA behind. And DNA, because it's unique to each individual, serves as an individual identifier. So it's often used in court cases, in forensic science, in determining um, basically uh, whether or not a suspect is in fact the perpetrator. So this man here on the right hand side is named Julius Ruffin. In 1981, he was um, arrested and convicted of rape on a college campus, a medical campus, medical school campus in Virginia. And he was identified based on witness testimony. Now, if you remember from chapter one, I didn't talk about it in the video, but there was a section in the chapter about how um, individuals are often misidentified uh, by eyewitnesses. So this happened to him. Um, many years later, they re-examined the case and found that using DNA evidence, this man was not actually the individual that uh, raped the victim that had identified him. And um, in this case, DNA was able to prove the innocence of this man who had claimed to be innocent all along. Now, this is not extremely common. Um, I should say um, individuals are not often um, misaccused, although it does happen. Um, our book states that there are 344 individuals um, that have been unjustly imprisoned and exonerated due to DNA evidence. So it's a really powerful tool. Um, but just keep in mind that um, even when it is used as this type of tool, it is used in conjunction with a lot of other evidence. Um, so um, people will take into account um, all of the facts at a crime scene, not just the DNA. But the DNA is one that um, is often a really key piece of information in a crime scene. Um, but it can be used for all kinds of other things, uh, paternity testing, um, identifying relationships between individuals, identifying relationships between living organisms. It doesn't have to be people. We can identify evolutionary relationships by studying DNA as well. So there's a lot of things that you can do with it. Um, and you would think that uh, maybe this molecule hasn't, or understanding of this molecule is, has been known for a really long time. In fact, um, the structure of the molecule and the way that it works really wasn't figured out until the 1950s. So this really important molecule is actually pretty young in, its under, in the understanding that we have of it. Um, so beginning in the 1950s, um, 
chemists and biologists began to really start investigating um, the structure and the nature of this molecule that contained all of our, our instructions. And initially they weren't even really sure what the molecule was. They knew DNA was present in the cell, they knew proteins were present in the cell, and based on the characteristics of proteins, they actually thought that proteins might encode this information. Um, they weren't entirely wrong, um, but through a series of tests they were able to determine that DNA is the molecule that actually contains the instructions and are the instructions that are passed down from parent to op offspring. So as these molecules are passed down, we see this continuity of life. We see that um, individuals have some of the same genetic information as their parents, but they're actually combos um, of both of their parents put together. Um, and then, of course, I've said it several times already, um, instructions for how to create a body, control its growth and development and behavior are all encoded in the DNA molecule. So it really is sort of a book of life contained within each cell. So many scientists worked on the chemical structure of DNA, and they hoped by determining the chemical structure, they could figure out how DNA was actually used by in the cell. So um, there were many people before them, uh, but here I have listed a few notable individuals um, who are important in determining the chemical structure of this molecule. Um, so one was American Linus Pauling. Um, he had won a Nobel Prize in chemistry for his work on um, understanding the structures of other molecules. Um, and so he began looking at the structure of DNA as well. Um, at the same time, there was a research group in England led by a man named Maurice Wilkins and um, a lady who worked for him named Rosalind Franklin. And they were using um, basically x-ray pictures of isolated DNA molecules in order to sort of understand the shape. Now, Rosalind Franklin was working really hard on this um, and she had many, many pictures um, that she was using and she had actually measured sort of the angles that are formed between the molecules and some of the distances between all these molecules. And then the information was finally put together by two men named Francis Crick and James Watson who were familiar with Wilkins and Franklin's work um, and had looked at similar information and were able to sort of put everything together um, and actually uh, propose the working structure, the one that we um, accept today, um, based on previous work of these individuals and their understanding of chemistry. So let's talk a little bit about this molecule. So DNA is a molecule called deoxyribonucleic acid. Now that's a big long word. I do want you to know it um, because the word itself actually gives us hints at what it's made of. DNA is a really large molecule. It's a long uh, chain-like molecule that's made up of individual units called nucleotides. So there are three units um, that make up what we call a base within the DNA. And the base, that nitrogen-containing base, is the one that actually is the sequence that we read and we glean information from. So let's look at this name. Deoxyribo refers to the sugar molecule. So one of the three components is the sugar molecule here. It's uh, this uh, the gray carbons and the two orange oxygens. Deoxy means there's no oxygen on this carbon here. Uh, ribo means it's a ribose sugar. So that's just the name of the sugar. So it's saying this sugar is a ribose sugar without an oxygen. That's important a little bit later. Um, attached to that is this part called a, called a phosphate group. So if you look here, we have a phosphorus molecule surrounded by a bunch of oxygen. That's our second part of this nucleotide. And then nucleic acid um, refers to this nitrogen containing base here, this double ring structure here. So we've got carbage, carbogen, <laughs> excuse me, carbon and nitrogen making up this base. 
all nucleotides consists of the phosphate and the sugar, and then they can change and have one of four bases as the third component. So this deoxyribo refers to the sugar, nucleic acid refers to this base. Now you'll just have to take my word for it that it's an acid. Um, we don't go into the chemistry of this molecule too much, so um, just kind of keep in mind that the acid refers to the nitrogen structure. So these nucleotides repeat along the structure of DNA and are what give us the sequence of bases. And that sequence is the code that our cells use to read and make proteins. The overall structure of DNA is called a double helix. This is essentially a twisted ladder. So if you take a long extension ladder, hold one end and twist the other, um, you get this double helix shape. You can make the same shape by twisting a flat shoelace um, or pretty much anything else that's flat and twistable. Um, you can get the, the general shape of it. These rungs of the ladder are our nucleotides. Here you can see the phosphate, the sugar, and here's our base. Now this ladder is actually made up of two backbones, just like a regular backbone, with the sugar and the phosphate group of each base pair, I'm sorry, each, I'll say base, each base repeating all the way down. So here we've got blue base, green base, blue base, green base, green base, purple base, blue base, green base, etc. all the way down. And we've got the backbone on one side. On the opposite side, we have a second backbone lined with repeating bases as well. So the sugar phosphate backbone is what gives it the overall stable structure. So DNA is a really stable molecule um, and the sugar phosphate makes it a very strong molecule. And the reason it has to be stable and strong is it's encoding all the important information in a cell. Then of course these rungs across the ladder are our bases and you can see here in the middle, we have our uh, the beginnings of a code. So A, C, A, G, T on one side, A, C, T, G, T on the other. The base pairs do something called complementary binding. So this means that each base recognizes one of another specific bases. And this is really important because it allows us to always know both sides of the strand. It also allows one side to act as a template for the other. And we'll see why this is important in a little bit when we talk about a process called transcription and another one called translation, and then in a couple chapters when we get to copying this molecule, DNA replication. So complementary base pairing occurs between specific bases. So adenine, this blue base here, nitrogenous base, always binds with a molecule called thymine. Now they are bound by something called hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are um, bonds that are individually weak. So think about um, just holding your, the hand of somebody loosely next to you. If you pull apart just one hand um, held together, um, it happens pretty easily. But together, when you have a whole bunch of hydrogen bonds, you get this really strong collective bond, and that helps with the stability of the molecules. Um, also bonding complementary, complementarily are this molecule here, guanine, and it bonds with a molecule called cytosine. If you look at the interaction that's occurring between these molecules, you'll see that adenine and thymine always form two hydrogen bonds, and guanine and cytosine always form three hydrogen bonds. Now this is important because those regions that are held by three hydrogen bonds are actually gonna bind a little bit more tightly than the ones that are held uh, by two hydrogen bonds. And that is um, something that we don't really get into in this class, but is actually really important in the overall structure of the molecule. So here we have sort of a summary of our structure. It's just the last few images all put together. 
Um, I did want to add that um, these bases are um, divided into two different types. We have this double ring structure here. These double ring bases are called purines. So your adenine and your guanine are called purines. And your single ring nitrogenous bases here are called pyrimidines. So thymine and cytosine are pyrimidines. The way that I remember it, this is thy, psi, pi. Uh, thymine, cytosine are pyrimidines. That's just my silly way of remembering it. You can remember it however you want. But um, just to recap, we've got three components to each base in our structure of DNA, the phosphate, the sugar, and the nitrogenous base, which can change depending on uh, which base is being added. We've got the overall double helix structure formed by two separate backbones held together by bases in the middle forming hydrogen bonds. Those bases bond complementary, complementarily, <laughs> having trouble with that word today, uh, where adenine always bonds to thymine, guanine always binds to cytosine. And this is important because it allows each strand to act as a template, either for replication or for gene expression. So let's talk about how genes uh, or how sections of DNA are turned into um, the functional molecules in the cell, which are proteins. So we need to start with a little bit of vo vocabulary. So DNA is a universal genetic code on Earth. All living organisms contain DNA as their coding molecule. This is because all living organisms can be traced back to a common ancestor um, that was using DNA as its life code. Um, so all living organisms are going to have DNA, and the more closely related two types of organisms are, the more similar their DNA is going to be. So we have a very, very similar DNA with our brothers and sisters, less similar with uh, someone who's not related to us, uh, even less similar th than, uh, uh, sorry, less similar DNA with, say, a chimpanzee, but we share still a lot of information with chimpanzees because we are um, relatively close ancestors uh, in the history of life. Uh, we share more DNA with all mammals than we do, uh, say, birds, or than we do with something like a yeast or bacteria. Um, a genome is an organism's complete set of DNA. So every single cell in our body contains our entire genome. Um, a chromosome is a single piece of DNA. So our genome is actually made up of 46 chromosomes. Um, those are just individual pieces of DNA that make up our genome. A gene is a specific sequence of DNA that codes for a protein. Um, that is just a very small portion on any chromosome, and genes are going to always code for the same type of protein, and they are always going to therefore produce a particular characteristic in an individual. The position on the chromosome of that gene is called the locus, uh, like the word location. Um, a, uh, the plural of this word is loci, so you can talk about the loci of many genes or the locus of a particular gene. Eukaryotic cells have uh, multiple chromosomes, whereas prokaryotic cells usually have one single circular chromosome. This diagram here shows eukaryotic DNA, I'm sorry, eukaryotic cell with eukaryotic DNA. If you look here, it actually, although it's kind of squiggly and wound up, um, is actually a single piece of DNA. If you stretch it out, it would be linear, whereas prokaryotic DNA is circular. So this is an oversimplification. This is showing one uh, eukaryotic chromosome. In fact, we have 23 types of chromosomes and two copies of each one, one from your mom and one from your dad. So we have a total of 46 pieces of DNA in each of our cells. Um, this is a total of approximately 3 billion base pairs, um, 3 billion base sequence uh, within our DNA. So quite a lot of genetic information there. 
And then down here on the bottom, we have a specific piece of DNA coding for uh, this purple blobby protein here. Um, so this is just a, a schematic to show you uh, what all this means within a cell. So uh, gene sequence um, averages about 3,000 base pairs. Um, so you can imagine that our genomes can encode a lot of information within our cells. Now a minute ago I said that each individual has, each human individual has 23 types of chromosomes with two copies each for a total of 46 pieces of DNA in our cells. Now we get one set of 23 from mom and one set of 23 from dad. And these may contain the same information or they may contain different information. So at each gene loci, um, we're going to encode for a particular trait. So a trait is a single characteristic or feature of an organism. So a trait would be something like hair color or um, eye color, uh, maybe beak size, maybe um, dog fur color. And then each version of those traits is called an allele. So each chromosome is going to code for a trait at a specific loci from either mom or dad. But mom or dad can give you different alleles. So you might think of this as, um, you know, one, one of your parents might have blue eyes, one of your parents might have brown eyes. You have brown eyes. Um, so you get the, each of the uh, allelic information from one of your parents and then we'll talk about later why you have brown eyes like one parent and not blue eyes like the other. Um, so alleles are different versions of the same gene. So this picture here shows um, the trait for flower petal with three different alleles. So we have orange petals making an orange flower. I'm sorry, the orange gene, orange allele of the flower petal gene coding for orange flower. You've got the yellow allele coding for the yellow flower petal trait and the purple allele coding to make a purple flower petal trait. So um, many of our genes are um, also infected, affected by the environment. Um, sometimes you have the interaction of many genes. So there's, there can be very complex ways of expressing these different alleles. And we'll talk about some of those later. Um, for now, just keep in mind that the trait is the characteristic you're talking about. The allele is the versions of the trait, uh, the versions of the gene that you might show. So a few minutes ago, I told you that DNA can encodes the instructions to make proteins. Um, that's not entirely true. A lot of our genes encode information for other things or don't really encode information at all. Um, the amount of DNA that a particular species has varies and it varies greatly. Um, and a lot of that can actually be DNA that doesn't appear to, to code for anything. Um, when this was first discovered, it was called junk DNA. We've since learned that that's not entirely correct. Um, so if we look at this picture in the middle, we see genome size. So remember, genome is the entire set of information, genetic material. Um, and it doesn't really matter how complex or simple you are. Um, genome size varies among organisms. So we see the fruit fly there. Um, these are the little guys that buzz around if you leave your bananas out for too long, uh, if you get rotten fruit. Um, they're really important in studies of uh, genetics um, starting a long time ago. Uh, then we've got humans. Um, this is in millions of base pairs. So um, fruit fly has about 180 million base pairs. Humans have 3.4 billion. Onions have 18 billions. And I'd imagine that most of you would argue that humans are more complicated than onions. Um, at least most of us are. And so it doesn't really make sense that onions have this much more DNA. But it is what it is. Um, then we've got amoeba, an amoeba down there that has 600 billion base pairs. And that's just a, a mind-blowing amount of DNA for something that most of us can't even see. I don't think any of us can see uh, without a microscope. So there's not really any correlation between um, organisms and genome size, except that uh, prokaryotic cells have 
vastly fewer amounts of DNA than eukaryotic cells. Um, if we look at the image on the right hand side, we have a bar graph again showing the amount of coding DNA. So humans have a whole bunch of DNA that doesn't code for very much. Uh, e. coli, this is um, a bacteria that is often uh, spoken about uh, unkindly because it uh, causes food poisoning and other things, um, but it actually is a bacteria that's found in your in your stomach all the time, doesn't cause any problems, there's just different varieties of it. Um, e. coli has 90% of its DNA functioning as coding sequence. Um, and then we've got a couple other examples in there in the middle. Arabidopsis is a little mustard plant that's used quite often for genetic studies. So humans have only 2% of their DNA working as coding information. So what is all this other stuff that we have? Uh, bacteria and viruses um, have uh, the, the genes in their uh, genome code for more than 90%. Um, there's not a lot of junk DNA in there. But eukaryotes have a large amount of non-coding DNA. Um, these fragments of non-coding sections um, that happen to be within a gene are called introns, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. Um, they are pieces that are essentially uh, stuck in the middle of a coding sequence, um, but are later removed uh, when the gene is being expressed. So we'll talk about those a little bit. Um, they do sometimes have a function. Um, most of those functions are um, a little bit more advanced than we'll go into in this class, but if you're interested, you can certainly come and ask me about those. Um, the remaining bits of non-coding genes are um, very often um, sort of consequences of evolution, uh, maybe mistakes in uh, replicating the DNA, um, and they can be really important in evolution as well. So these other non-coding regions can be uh, duplicate genes, genes that have been copied and inserted somewhere else. They can be um, du duplicate genes that don't have a function anymore, and so the sequence sort of degrades. So they, they used to be a functioning gene, they're not functioning genes anymore. Um, they can be uh, fragments that are left over from uh, botched repair jobs. Um, so there are a lot of reasons uh, that we might have uh, the, these non-coding sections. Excuse me. As I said, for a long time they thought that these uh, sections were just complete junk. Um, in actuality, some of these sections are really important in gene regulation, which is telling the cell uh, what to turn, what genes to turn off and to turn on and when. Um, and although they are called junk DNA, they are actually a really important source of evolutionary information. For example, if you have a gene that's been duplicated, the original gene can go on performing its regular function, but the other one can change. Um, and that can lead to new or different functions for that gene in, in an organism and eventually leading to evolution of that group of organisms. So how do genes work? Um, let's talk again um, about a couple of important um, uh, vocabulary words. There's a lot in this chapter, but they're going to be important. We're going to need them a little bit later. So the genotype um, is the particular version of a gene that an organism carries for a particular trait. So we looked at those flower petals. Um, the allele for the orange petals would be called the orange genotype. <coughs> Pardon me, I'm sorry. The phenotype is the physical expression of the gene. So it's, it's the physical characteristic that the gene produces. So let's talk about how we um, go from DNA out to our protein. So the process of gene expression is going from genotype to phenotype. So going from the genetic information to the physical characteristic of the organism. So in this process, we are going to go from DNA, so our source of information, to the production of a molecule called RNA, which is very similar to DNA. And it's a little piece of our information that's going to be used to make our proteins. 
So we will get to it later, <clears throat> but part of uh, maintaining DNA is a process of DNA replication. DNA replication is important um, in passing down genetic information to the next generation of cells. Um, <clears throat> but in the process of gene expression, we're going to go from DNA to RNA via something called transcription. So transcription is essentially rewriting a small piece of DNA information into RNA information. So just like uh, the word transcription as when we're talking about languages, um, we're just rewriting it. But we're sort of rewriting it in dialect. So it would be like rewriting from information from American English to uh, British English or from a uh, California accent to a Southern accent. Um, we are keeping the nucleotide language, uh, but just changing it slightly from DNA to RNA. <clears throat> In the second step of this process of gene expression, we're going to change languages. We're going to go from the nucleotide language of RNA to the protein language of amino acids. And so this process is how we go from our genotype here in our DNA to our phenotype that is produced by a given protein. <clears throat> 